Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for today's webinar is Resilient Power in Puerto Rico, Innovative Applications for Solar Plus Storage to Serve Vulnerable Populations. This webinar is being presented by Clean Energy Group as part of our Resilient Power Project, and we have a couple of excellent guest speakers today. Before I pass it over to them, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our attendees are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of the webinar. You can call in using a telephone, or you can connect using your computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize the webinar console so that you can view the presentation full screen, you can click on the little orange arrow that you see circled here. You can also use that to expand the webinar console. Um, one thing that we would love for you to do during this webinar is to submit your questions and your comments uh, as you think of them by typing them into the questions box on the control panel and hitting send. We will get to as many questions as we can following our presentations. Um, we do expect to get a lot of questions. We've had a lot of people register for this webinar. So to make sure that we get to your question, don't wait until the very end. Um, type it in when you think of it. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you an email probably this afternoon with a copy of the webinar recording and a PDF of the slides. And we'll also post all of those materials on our website at cleanegroup.org backslash webinars. So with that out of the way, I'd like to pass it over to our host for today's webinar. She's going to get us started. That is Mariel Mango. She is a program associate here at Clean Energy Group working as part, uh, for the Resilient Power Project. And um, she, she's gonna get it started. Mari, over to you. Thanks, Sam, and thank you everyone today for joining us. Before I introduce the presenters and get into our webinar, I just wanted to give a quick introduction as to who we are at Clean Energy Group. Clean Energy Group is a national nonprofit organization. We're based in Vermont, and we work to advance innovation in clean energy technologies through fi finance, policy, and individual project level support. Our work is funded through support from a number of private foundations, many of which you can see here. We also have a sister organization, Clean Energy States Alliance, which is a membership coalition of organizations, primarily state agencies that manage clean energy funds. The Resilient Power Project aims to improve access to resilient power technologies, primarily solar PV combined with battery storage, in low-income and otherwise disadvantaged communities. Our efforts include advocacy, education, including webinars like these, and project development support. We work with state and federal policymakers to advance policies, incentives, and regulatory structures that enable greater access, author analysis and reports, and host webinars. You can find all of these resources at our website, cleanegroup.org. You can see here that we've worked on over 150 projects across the country. Many projects highlighted in this map um, are located on the east and the west coast, but we're increasingly supporting partners in the Midwest and the Southeast as well on projects ranging from affordable housing to community centers to senior centers to medical clinics. If you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to visit our website or to reach out to Clean Energy Group directly. So today we have a great set of speakers. Um, Oscar Weiss has extensive experience in community coalition building and regenerative environmental practices. Born and raised in Puerto Rico where his interest in solar power formed, he then served for 11 years in the US Army, first as a combat medic in Iraq and later as a base medic in Germany and Washington DC. Following his reentry into civilian life, Oscar started a nonprofit with four friends called Community Through Colors, which combined renewable energy installation service projects with an extensive pardon me, an extensive trip through the continental United States. Immediately after Hurricanes Irma and Maria devastated the Caribbean, Community Through Colors reconfigured itself towards immediate disaster relief and formed the Sail Relief Team Project, selling much needed supplies throughout the Caribbean, installing emergency solar power systems and coordinating direct service in multiple sites. Currently as the Executive Director of Sail Relief Team based in Vieques, Puerto Rico, Oscar oversees the triple stand a strand of the organization's mission, relief, including immediate disaster response, recovery, 
such as reconstruction, installation, long-term community needs, and resilience, maintenance of solar systems, creating food autonomy links to Puerto Rico, legislative um, practices and advising on microgrids and renewable energy. First up present presenting, we have Will Hygar. He sees every disaster as an opportunity to build back greener. A registered paramedic, Will responded with International Medical Corps to Typhoon Haiyan, then deployed solar refrigeration in West Africa through the Ebola outbreak. Domestically, Will's been on the ground with Team Rubicon after disasters in Louisiana, Minnesota, and Puerto Rico. Fascinated by the connection between public health, environmental science, and humanitarian crises, he leads projects that sit at the nexus of emergency response and sustainable development. He currently serves on the board of the Minnesota Volunteer Organizations Active in Disasters um, and as the founder and director of the Footprint Project. Will received his BA in Peace and Conflict Studies from the University of California, Berkeley. Will, I will let you take it from here. Thank you. I'm gonna try to get this mouse clicky thing working first. Um, and thank you to the Clean Energy Group for providing a platform to talk about our work. Um, I am going to run through our kind of overall background on what the Footprint Project does, then how we got involved in the Resilient Power in Puerto Rico project, thanks to the support from Clean Energy Group, and then um, a couple of lessons that we've learned from uh, putting solar panels and batteries on wheels. Uh, and sending them to uh, communities in crisis. So I'm gonna see if this clicky thing works. Oh, yay, okay. So the problem that we're trying to solve at Footprint Project is really that when large crises uh, hit, uh, disaster responders generally don't focus on sending sustainable technologies. Some do, but in many, many cases, uh, disaster relief is powered with uh, plastic and, and diesel. So our goal is really to help uh, disaster response partners transition their programs off fossil fuels and leave uh, technologies that are, are better um, serving to the community to ultimately re uh, recover more resiliently. Um, the my, This is one of my favorite pictures uh, ever taken after Hurricane Irma in the uh, St. John's Islands. And uh, I think it kind of sums up what we're trying to do, right? We we don't, we want to encourage and and kind of hold the hands of responders so that they can send the, the right tools um, and leave uh, technologies that don't become giant paperweights um, after the, the response budgets run out. Um, so our mission is really to turn every disaster into an opportunity to, for sustainable development. And we do that kind of in three phases. During the emergency response phase, when the grid is down, we mobilize pretty much every available solar generator asset we know of in the region using our database and our network of uh, community partners. And then as the, the grid is returning during that early recovery phase, we work with uh, local solar installers and um, businesses to de decommission damaged solar installations and recover the functional panels, which keeps those out of landfills, and then repurpose those panels um, paired with refurbished EV batteries in the kind of long-term resilience phase, that kind of three to six months to a year out um, to build new turnkey solar generators with that second life equipment that then can be uh, redeployed in that region the next time that the grid goes down. So um, we, we're trying to basically develop a fleet of mobile solar generator assets um, that can be rapidly deployed and then build that fleet with the communities who are, who are recovering. Uh, okay, and so, so what we've noticed is that there's, there's kind of a significant need for, for power access in the emergency response phase to reduce the pollution caused by by diesel or, or gas generators in that in those communities that are already um, suffering, and then we we particularly in recent deployments have noticed that bringing in a clean, quiet uh, solar hub really creates a a community space. No one really charges their their cell phone or their medical equipment next to a large, noisy, polluting generator. Um, so creating these these rapidly deployable, quiet, clean systems can really develop a, a, a community operating hub 
um, in a uh, neighborhood or a um, any city that's that's been where the lights are still still out. Um, we're really focusing on using Second Life equipment to build new systems because we we see that as a as a Second Life um, a double green bottom line for for using keeping PV you know solar panels out of landfills and and EV batteries out of um, landfills as well. Um, okay, so so I wanted to get to the 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 actual reason where I'm here. Um, the trailer that we built through the, the Resilient Power Project um, with support from Clean Energy Group was really our, our biggest mobile solar system that, that we've uh, designed and constructed yet. It was a, a five kilowatt solar array uh, with a 20 kilowatt hour battery bank and, and an aluminum custom uh, frame trailer that has an interior and exterior uh, space. So this was designed in, in Wisconsin um, and deployed through uh, down to Vieques last year. Um, the, and I'll get a little more to that, but we recently, um, I'll just talk about our general impact quickly. Um, we're, we're working on two projects right now, the Puerto Rico earthquake response, which kind of evolved out of the resilient power in Puerto Rico project. And we recently deployed uh, a solar system to the Tennessee tornadoes. We also operate a lot with training and uh, preparedness work by um, engaging communities where we have other mobile solar assets um, to to uh, displace diesel generators in training exercises or other temporary events. Um, so the final design for this trailer was uh, developed in Wisconsin. Uh, the aluminum frame and solar panels was fabricated uh, uh, there, and then Oscar actually from <laughs> Sail Relief Team and Community Through Colors uh, helped drive it from Wisconsin down to Florida, um, where it was put on a boat in Fort Lauderdale, um, delivered to San Juan, and then we installed the Simplify uh, battery bank and the... I'm actually going to go back the simplified battery bank and the the sole arc inverter in the trailer in San Juan because they were shipped separately. Um, so it was a really exciting uh, kind of way to see a sol mobile solar system come together from two different places. We called the the aluminum frame trailer that was shipped from Wisconsin or driven from Wisconsin a solar shell. Um, because it didn't have batteries or an inverter wired in yet. It was just the frame of the trailer with the panel, the solar panels or solar modules um, integrated. And then the batteries and inverter shipped separately from uh, California for the Simplify batteries that were donated from Simplify and uh, solar inverter from Texas. Um, so it was a fun uh, little trial on how to do that. Now the re real... Um, kind of next steps now that the trailer is in Vieques is one to to build out that interconnection to the municipal office of emergency management where the um, trailer is is being donated um, so that they can use it as both a mobile solar battery system and also a um, basically a backup generator for their building um, the the inverter is the eight kilowatt 12240. Uh, volt inverter so we're we really designed it so that it could pretty much plug in to the small um, office of emergency management building on Vieques and provide backup power when it's not being deployed to a uh, a separate site on the island um, so yeah these are the final system components um, I'm happy to kind of go into that later for all the the energy nerds on the call um, but pretty much we 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 use this project to try to put as many many panels as we could on on wheels a, as big of a battery bank as we could find thank you to simplify and, and then uh paired it with that solar converter um the goal for 2020 for us in this project specifically is really to improve improve our mobile solar storage designs based around integrated use cases. So whether that's being, whether the system is being used as a communication station or a mobile kitchen or uh, you know, a construction or landscaping trailer, um, those, are, those have different uh, needs for both power and usable space. Um, we generally focus on trying to put the solar panels above standing height so that they can become a shade structure in, um, you know, 
small areas where there's a limited space for to lay out a large solar field like urban or, or uh, response or search, search and rescue um, and then of course we were really working to build up an integrated program that that kind of mixes disaster preparedness workforce development through that integration of a solar shell with the actual component wiring and then renewable energy education because we really think that we can build a, a solar trailer but if if the end users don't have a full understanding on how to how that you know is different and the same or or similar to a generator um it, the the bit the fanciest toy in the world isn't gonna isn't gonna solve that that um generator problem um so so we're really developing a a, a rapid training on solar battery systems for non-engineers particularly emergency re responders firefighters and um, paramedics so that when the grid goes down if we send a, you know, can activate a, a mobile solar storage um, system, uh, those emergency um, responders can actually kind of understand what asset they're they're doing. Well, I think we've lost audio for you. Can you hear me? Towards uh, a kind of more modular scalable microgrids that can be um, mixed and matched for different um, deployable, um, different disasters and different deployments. So this hey, is Will, a, yep. sorry to interrupt. I think we, we lost your audio. Would you mind, I think just one slide back if you want to go back. Yeah, just one of course. Slide. Thanks. No worries. The shelter, I'll talk about the shelter again. I could talk about the shelter all day. Um, so basically, we're working on a new new um, tool if for the toolkit that is a flexible PV uh, tent that can be deployed with the, the trailers to provide kind of a modular microgrid um, for different response um, settings. Um, and the real goal here is to um, do a kind of hub and spoke model, which I'll get to. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about recent responses because we've learned a lot with our uh, latest, um, you know, 2020 has been a big <laughs> a year, I think, for everyone. And um, we bounced from the Earth, Puerto Rico earthquakes where we uh, um, served 11,000 people with um, access to, to clean mobile energy and then right into the Tennessee tornado response where we had a trailer that actually was in the path of the storm of the tornado and came out unscathed we were able to deploy it within 24 hours um to 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 and then kind of shift it bounce it back and forth between areas that did not have power in north and east nashville um the uh, the the what we've noticed time and time again is that you roll up a, a clean quiet uh, solar system in a space that's otherwise powerless and people show up and it and it becomes a, a kind of a community gathering hub. Um, the and then this is the first time in the in the Tennessee, Tennessee tornadoes where we got to physically trial the second wave second life pilot with light wave solar. So we uh, decommissioned some some uh, damaged uh, solar uh, rooftop solar systems, and now those panels will be repurposed into portable um, solar battery systems. Um, we're going to build a new solar trailer for Nashville as part of a community recovery program, um, which is going to be bigger, slightly different than the Vieques trailer, but um, have interior space, which is exciting, um, kind of stand up interior space. Um, so we're, we're trying to kind of streamline and standardize our designs. And then I, I added this slide last minute. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Um, because what I, I think it's important to kind of understand these different products as or, or tools as an integrated um, hub and spoke logistic set. So the goal is really to be able to create a, a mothership clean energy system that can then um, from which you can pull out portable um, integrated power shelter systems um, that can be you know deployed to individual homes 
or to other mobile command centers so that um, you know ind individuals can use power their CPAPs or oxygen or other critical medical devices without having to, to refill gas. Um, and then just quickly before we um, switch over, I, I just think given the current context, we, we should just briefly discuss what we're trying to do with COVID. Um, we recently uh, started spinning up our COVID solar response program. I'm in El Paso right now, and I'll be driving one of our solar trailers from Phoenix to um, Brownsville, Texas, for the where it'll cross over the border um, likely this weekend to help power the Matamoros um, Asylum Camp um, COVID clinic, which is being set up in partnership with Global Response Management. And I think given the fact that COVID is a respiratory disease, we, we should just highlight that um, thousands of these uh, sites are going to be set up and thousands of gallons of diesel and gas are going to be burning right next to patients in respiratory distress. And I think that there's, there's an important lesson that we could um, learn, particularly in 2020, um, as we're kind of bearing down on our climate crisis, um, that that we really have an opportunity to to pilot existing technologies and, and um, change kind of the the landscape of disaster response. We just need uh, partners. Um, so with that, we're building out our our hubs. We're trying to get to 24-hour response times and um, building as many mobile solar systems as we can, as fast as we can. Um, if you'd like to get involved, please just uh, contact me or, or, or um, uh, CEG is, is um, the right way to go and we need all the help we can get. Um, Oscar is, has been incredibly supportive of our Puerto Rico missions. Um, so with that, I'll just kind of stop and, and Oscar can take it from there. Um, thanks again for, for listening. Great, thanks very thank much, Will. Okay, Oscar, I'm pulling your slide. Okay, should be all set. Oscar, you should be good to go. Oscar, you might be muted. Oscar, can you hear us? I can see that your your mouse is active, but I can't I can't hear you. Um, Oscar, do you want to try calling in, or you can click on the telephone and then click back on the computer audio. Sometimes that resets it. Any luck? We're still not hearing you. Um, Oscar, if you want to call in, um, and then while you're working on that, maybe we could um, take a few questions if any came in for Will. Great, sure. So we did have a couple questions for you, Will, during your presentation. The first was if you could uh -oh. provide the, the specs of the battery system that you used on the trailer, such as what the chemistry was with the company that you worked with and then kind of building off of that what were your estimated costs total for putting the trailer together and how was the project funded totally um the batteries were six simplify 3.8s it came out to about 21 kilowatt hours of lithium iron phosphate um we were incredibly um fortunate to have some a really strong partnership with simplify 
they uh, donated all of the batteries, which is um, kind of significant, significantly cut the cost of the build. Um, are we pulled that um, project off with thirty-five thousand dollars, which is kind of unrealistic for a re, you know, another build of that that type. The aluminum frame was built at cost. The batteries were donated. The inverter was subsidized, um, and we um, were were able to do it with one uh, an incredible grant from Clean Energy Group. Thank you. Um, and then a uh, separate build grant from um, Blue Haven Initiative, uh, uh, social impact firm out of Chicago. Um, we think if we were going to do it again, we could pull that um, build off if we kind of assumed all the costs, um, including the transport and stuff, um, for about $65,000. We are trying to um, reduce those costs by switching um, to steel frame trailers, which are cheaper. Um, though they rust more uh, quicker in in C, you know, in temperate climates, um, so it's kind of pros and cons. Great, thanks. Well, we we do have a bunch more questions, but I'm going to save them for after because I do think we have Oscar back on the line. Oscar, are you Yay. good to go? Yes, I'm 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 on the line. I'm I'm phoning in. Great, thanks. Yeah, like. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Edgar Oscar Ruiz. I'm the executive director for Seven Leaf Team, a project of Community Through Colors. We got our start with this project right after Maria, after the hurricane that hit um, Puerto Rico. Let me get back one slide. So we all know Maria hit in Puerto Rico in September of 2017 and basically wiped out all of the grid and the basically left everybody without power in Puerto Rico. So it was one of those things that kind of showcased the vulnerability of the grid that we have in Puerto Rico in the first place. And then it kind of just showcased the need for solar and storage specifically. Um, so one of the things that we did, we actually hopped on a sailboat and we brought a bunch of supplies down specifically to an island off the coast of Puerto Rico called Vieques, which is still part of Puerto Rico, but it's um, to get to it, you need to go from the state to Puerto Rico, and then from Puerto Rico, you got to hop on a ferry and get to Vieques. And because of the hurricane, they were having a lot of issues um, getting the ferries back online because they had to move to different ports just to even protect from the storm and then try and bring them back. So let's see if these slides. Operate. Uh. So, like I said, one of the things that we did is we actually sell down with um several different supplies and one of the supplies that we sold out was uh, um, a few solar and storage kits and uh, the slide that I have up now was from one of the university professors from the University of Puerto Rico that basically looked at the power loss after Maria and he was focusing on how do we look at it from a nonprofit and philanthropy perspective on how do we target that money more specifically to the most people in need and what they realized was the last 200,000 customers were the longest that were without power and those were affected the most, which should be the ones that we should be targeting for um, like nonprofit and philanthropy work. And specifically here in Vieques, um, when he did the study, he didn't focus too much on Vieques because we were actually powered by these um, backup diesel generators that were installed sometime between February and June of 2018, and they ran the island all the way to December of 2018. And then because the underwater cable comes from Puerto Rico and then first goes to Vieques and then goes to Culebra, Culebra was running on these backup generators until March of 2019. 
So there was the logistical issue of having to bring the diesel on the ferries that are already overcrowded, we're just bringing people and regular supplies. We were struggling just to get enough diesel to keep these generators running for over a year. So we're focusing specifically on solar and storage on the island of Vieques and and by and large Culebra because they're kind of hooked up to us under an underwater cable because of just the logistical issues of bringing power when it's um, when we have anything going on. One of the other problems that we're facing with the grid specifically here in Vieques and Culebra is the underwater cable that supplies both of them is already getting close to the end of life and we're going to have to start talking about what solutions are we going to bring other than trying to just relay an underwater cable to connect both the islands. So here's a picture of the underwater cable. As you guys can see, it's getting towards the end of its useful life, but at the same time, this beach where it's connected to actually used to have like a couple hundred feet of sand. So this was a couple hundred feet from the actual water. And then after where, yeah, all that sand got swept away. And as you can see through the gate, the water is already messing with the connection itself. So we got a few years before like something major might happen. And this is our connection to the grid to both for both Vieques and Culebra. So, and here's a picture from that study that the professor did specifically talking about Puerto Rico. These were the locations of where the last people that got connected to the power were. And if you kind of look at kind of like the picture that you see here, most of it in the center of the island, if you don't know too much about the topography of Puerto Rico, it's all mountains regions, just like where it takes a really, really long time to get the grid reconnected just because of accessibility when it comes to roads, because they're just winding roads going up the mountains. And then the stuff on the southeast side, that's where the hurricane actually for, made first landfall. So that was just a lot of cleanup before they can even get the line back up. And then specifically, the one of the things that we're working with the Clean Energy Group is we're trying to do a small microgrid in Vieques with, um, we have an area in Vieques specifically that was the last that was connected even to the grid inside of Vieques itself, whereas there's about 400 residential clients, there's about 12 to 16 businesses and one to three schools, depending on how you call them. And, um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to utilize the roof space of customers that have in Puerto Rico we have construction that most people tend to lay a concrete flat roof so it's perfect for installing solar and a lot of people that um, would be underserved on the solar um, financing side of the house they have the benefit of having this extra roof space so we can put some extra panels and then they could possibly sell the extra electricity that they generate to other residents or possibly some of these businesses that don't have the roof space to provide all their solar needs. And here's a picture of more or less a sector in Vieques called Esperanza and as you can see it's all kind of like already gridded up and it's fairly tight. So from the engineering point of view, it makes it a lot easier kind of like cut it off and kind of the reason why we selected this is just it's it makes it easy to kind of pick the sector and be like, here's where we're going to draw the line for the microgrid itself. And then one of the other things that we're working with the clean energy group and also with footprint is um, solar training. One, one, one of the other biggest problems that we have in, you know, Puerto Rico in general, but specifically in Vieques, we don't actually have any licensed solar installers in Vieques. We have three off-grid installers. And as you can imagine, after a while, they're just so overworked that like it's good luck trying to get a hold of them, even if you have an issue with trying to get anything fixed. And one of the one of the things that we have in Puerto Rico, the laws only allow licensed master electricians or electrical engineers to be licensed solar installers. But the laws do allow for off grid installers behind the meter. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to fill the gap between just an average person that doesn't know anything about solar and a licensed electrical 
you know, electrical engineer or licensed master electrician because that way they can work under one of those people and then the master electrician self license or the electrical engineer knows that they have some training so they can, you know, work some stuff through the phone or that way we meet the law requirements while also going around the logistical issue, just trying to bring the people here. And then, so one of the things that we uh, will talk about a little bit that we've been collaborating is with the solar trailers, that solar trailer that he showcased that we brought all the way down from Wisconsin as well as yes, it's right now for uh, the emergency management office. And one of the things that we're talking about is trying to get some of these trailers specifically here for Vieques that we can connect to this microgrid whenever they're not being utilized because we can use the power that they generate to be sold to some customers or to provide power to the grid and whenever they need to be, you know, utilized in other places around Vieques, they can just be unplugged and driven to the locations to either move water pumps or provide help in some of those community centers that we haven't installed solar in stores yet or people that have medical needs that need ventilators or medical machines that need to be running 24 seven. And this is one of the pictures of collaboration that we did with Footprint. We did a three day solar training up in Las Marias. It was two days of classroom and one day of practical where we installed one of the solar systems in one of the community centers. And that's one of the things that we're trying to focus on to bring specifically to Vieques to do some more of that training. And then on the bigger picture, we also deliver solar and storage to other islands. So we have done several um, deliveries and a few installations. We did a delivery to Antigua and Barbuda. We did a delivery to Dominica. We did one to St. Croix, St. Thomas. And then the one, the big one that we did last year, we took 500 solar kits to an island off the coast of Haiti called Ile Vache. And we have a third of the island running on solar and battery kits right now. And we utilize sailboats because they just allow us to get to ports that are a lot smaller, that are normally not serviced by commercial operators, and it makes it easier for us to bring the A where it's needed the most. And that's just uh, the boat being offloaded in Antigua. The, the lithium batteries tend to be pretty heavy, at least these ones are, so it takes a little bit more effort. And that about wraps it up. If anybody has any questions or if they have anything to add, just feel free to ask. Great. Thank you so much. That was awesome. We do have quite a few questions. So I'm going to start and, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll hit all of them. I encourage you, if you do have more questions as we're speaking, feel free to have them come in. We're going to try to address as many as possible. Um, Oscar, I'm going to start with you. Are the projects that you're working on, do they have the ability to provide net metering benefits? Um, and does PEPA charge to obtain permission to install solar panels on a home? Are there any additional charges? So as it sounds right now, most of the community centers that we put solar systems on have been off the grid. So we haven't done the net metering with PREPA as of yet. Um, my understanding right now, PREPA is not charging for net metering, but that's still up in the air because they're going back and forth on the net metering regulations and, this, and there's some talks about a solar tax and all that. But as of right now, it should be, it would be allowed to be net metered and it shouldn't cost other than a basic usage fee that it's three or five dollars right now. Great, thanks. Um, this, I think, could be a question for both of you. Working with the batteries, regardless if they're on a trailer or on a rooftop, are there fire concerns from your perspective or that um, partners that you've been working with have had? And if so, how are those addressed? Oscar, you want me to grab this one? Yeah, if you want to grab it, I'll just fill in after that. Yeah, absolutely. So there's one we, one of the reasons why we've we've used and kind of looked to the most uh, lithium iron phosphate chemistries and particularly lithium iron phosphate chem chemistries that have an internal BMS and breaker. So that's why at least 
aside from having an incredible partner um, out of, you know, from Simplify, they also make really, really safe batteries. Um, we have, we recently trialed a refurbished uh, Nissan Leaf batteries in a new solar trailer we built in Phoenix. And that is a um, not lithium iron phosphate that has cobalt in it, which does make the risk of thermal runaway higher. And what we, how we've mitigated that risk is really by working with our integrator to ensure a really, really strong rapid shutdown sequence with a really um, dialed in VMS. So, there, so we see a need to figure out how to use refurbished EVs for a, two different reasons. One, they're cheap and scalable, and two, they have a, um, they can, they actually meet a double, you know, green bottom line. We don't want a bunch of EV batteries going into a waste, you know, landfill just because we're saying that we're greener um, than, than fossil fuels. So we see that's important to figure out. But there is a, definitely a, a larger risk of, of thermal runaway with uh, any batteries that are using cobalt, which is why for like new for builds that we're going to do that where we're going to send it off to someone else, like an emergency manager and say, here's this to like toy. See, see you in a couple months. We really focus. We recommend using um, uh, iron phosphate chemistries with an internal BMS, like Simplify. And and then for um, and then I was just gonna add for um, installations that are not like mobile, kind of like what Will's talking about. We also just look at installing the batteries in a place where it's away from like people and personnel. So that way, if something does happen, it's away from everybody. Great, thank you. Um, again, another question for both of you. Are there any risks to, um, what are the risks to solar equipment during hurricanes and earthquakes? Are there any precautions that are made or how do you work with folks on, on preparing for that? So I'll jump in on this one. One of the biggest things about a solar system when you're talking about solar and storage is most of your components, it's your inverters, your controllers, and your batteries, are, most of them are going to be inside a building or a facility. So they, you should install them in a place that they're already protected by hurricanes. So like 80 to 90% of your cost of your system is already protected. When it comes to the solar panels, most of the panels that were installed before Maria, most of them survive. And a lot of the ones that didn't survive the error was installation error, where either bolts were missing or bolts were not tying down. So you just double check that you install them properly. And that way you minimize the risk of losing some of the system. But even then, even if you lose all your panels, you still got most of your system that's still inside and should be protected. And Great, the only thing thank you. I'd add there is I, I don't my our opinion on this is just, I think you're gonna get a very different opinion than um, like the any safety precautions for grid tide or rooftop or um, ground mount systems which have a completely different racking system um, to hold the the at least the solar modules since our systems are running you know vibrating down the freeway pretty much all the time we hard bolt them into the the directly to the trailer frame um, so the risk of the panels flying off in a hurricane is probably much lower um, but the risk of the trailer flying away from a you know <laughs> in, in the tornado or hurricane has is a slightly higher that said you can move it if you know where the path of the storm is um, but we basically say it if we're going to do this stuff, we need a really solid maintenance plan and insurance on those units. Um, and the, the final thought is that we did have, first, first trial yet was uh, the Tennessee tornado where our solar trailer was in East Nashville. The tornado passed about 50 yards from it. And yeah, I mean, a four foot, Four, four foot diameter tree fell within 12 feet of the trailer. Luckily it was between two houses, so it kind of didn't get too shooken up, but it actually, uh, you know, 
it was on the whole time um, and was able to deploy with, you know, and plug into as soon as the debris was moved out of the road. So um, really hard to say when, you know, if these things are going to survive bigger tornadoes or bigger hurricanes, but um, we found good, we've had good luck so far by putting these things on wheels. Great. And Will, this question is for you. Can you explain a bit more about how you imagine the central trailer to be a hub for systems that can be used by individuals who need to power home medical equipment? How do you see that working? And is that something that um, it's being used for now or uh, you anticipate will be increasingly used for? I love this question. Um, so thanks to whoever asked it. Um, I think there's a really, really exciting trend that we're going to see as grid outages get more frequent, more severe, and last longer, where a large mobile solar battery system with a large battery bank, I'm talking above 20 kilowatts up to 150 kilowatt hours, um, with a integrated PV system could provide a the hub. Um, and then within that trailer, you could hold at least with a 14 by seven foot trailer, you could hold three tents, solar tents, and 10 to 20 portable power systems based on what size those batteries are. Um, and up to 100 handheld power packs, like the ones that charge your, you know, that have one um, three prong outlet that could charge a CPAP machine, basically. So what, I mean, what I'm kind of, envisioning here and what we're trying to work towards is a hub and spoke model by which a firefighter or cal fire or um, fema rolls in a large trailer solar nano grid trailer pulls out their tents sets up their mobile incident command which is all solar powered and then um, delivers these portable power packs kind of like goal zero sized um, you know, suitcase sized solar battery systems to households that have, um, you know, portable medical or, or home medical needs, oxygen concentrators and um, CPAPs and insulin storage generally are, are the three big, big needs. And then when those battery packs drain, the, the just similar to a gas line, you could imagine um, folks coming back to the hub and swapping their drained portable battery for a new battery that's been charged from that um, larger trailer or um, um, solar hub. Um, so yeah, it's, it's still in the works, but we, I mean, all of this technology is here. It's not, this is not, we're not inventing a new chemistry or re, you know, re, uh, reinventing the wheel. It's really about integrating the programs with that, with existing technologies. So um, I don't see there's any barrier of this idea from from a technical side. It's really about which how to make it um, happen and how to fund it is, and that's really the question because a lot of this stuff is just expensive technology. Great, that was really great. Thanks, Will. Um, a question for both of you. Um, people have heard a lot of concerns regarding the long-term O&M of facilities with solar and storage post-disaster in terms of parts availability, cost, and local technical capacity. You know, understanding that these systems are running on emergency response operations currently or when they're deployed, um, if there's any additional thoughts that either of you have on how this is or should be addressed into the future, that would be great. Oscar, you want to go? <laughs> Yeah, I'll I'll talk about this one. So one of the things that we focus on when we do solar installations is O and M because we have seen it too many times where people just install this beautiful solar system that's like you know, can run everything and then they two things. One they, they don't think about O and M and do two, they don't think about training. So then we have the problem that something happens, something hiccup something as simple as just the button is flipped off. And we have this hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollar people where just sitting there and people are like staring at it and going like, Well, I guess it's just gonna sit there. So the biggest thing is like when people are thinking about installing a solar system, especially on the non profit and philanthropic side of the house, if you think about the O and M of thinking about like who's gonna maintain it from 
you know, for the first couple of years, and then what's the plan for the five, ten, and twenty year? And that's one of the reasons why, you know, us and Footprint are focusing on doing solar training to make sure that we have some people that can like just look it over, make sure it's running, and can troubleshoot it at least at at a basic level. And then, you know, if it's too complicated, then we talk about you know, bringing in an expert like an electrical engineer or a microgrid engineer. Bill, you got stuff to add? <laughs> no, I thought, I thought that was pretty comprehensive. Um, I would only add that, that remote monitoring is, is really important. Um, and, but none of, no, no amount of, uh, you know, Wi-Fi or satellite uplink data, to, you know, remote comms system is going to substitute for someone who knows what the red blinky light means on the inverter and knows when to call that um, that inverter company. So I think I just want to echo um, Oscar's statement that that um, training up human capacity is always going to leave a community more resilient than building in a really fancy tech solution. I think this is a great segue. We've got a bunch of questions related to the solar training um, that was touched upon. Oscar, do you know if, um, are you anticipating that in Puerto Rico there might be amendments to laws or regulatory changes that allows people um, other than master electricians or is a new type of certification that can help expedite this? And then a question for both of you, just if you could expand on the solar training in general that you're currently working on and, and the gaps and the obstacles. So when it comes to laws in Puerto Rico and like changing, I mean, the last two and a half years have been at least pretty exciting on the solar energy industry because it went from like PREPA was the only utility that was allowed to provide power to like there's new microgrid regulations that allow people to generate their own power. You can you can sell power and you can we wheel it and deal it back and forth. Like the, the legal structures to allow a lot of these things to happen is there. There's a few talks about changing a few of the nuances of how the law is written and that might or might not change. Like I said, off-grid solar stores are allowed to work behind the meter and then you can work in conjunction with a local master electrician or a licensed electrical engineer for solar and just have them like oversee your project or just verify that, you know, you handle the paperwork out of the house and just work in a collaboration with them and that should cover most of your bases there on the legal aspect going. But by and large, most of the laws are in place now. It's just doing the work of getting all these systems installed and set up. And then what was the second part on that question? Just general questions in terms of expanding on how the solar training is going, if there are obstacles to it, what you see as next steps. The, the biggest that obstacle that I see, yeah, I think the biggest obstacle that we see is just getting the, just getting the funding to be able to do some of these, to get people fully licensed under NAPSAP to get a certification, you need to be able to do some of these installs. So one of the ways that we've been doing it is we've been trying to use philanthropic or nonprofit installs to get people certified. So just finding funding to be able to do more community centers and do more community projects that impact the community. It's the biggest obstacle that I see right now. Great, well, do you have anything that you'd like to add regarding the training? <laughs> yeah, th thanks. I, I mean, I think Oscar hit the nail on the head. It's, um, I think there's a huge gap between the engineer level trainings, you know, NAPSAP certifications and above, and awareness, community awareness or response um, and resilience, resiliency training. So, for example, you know, firefighters in the U.S. There's only a couple that actually know have been trained on solar and fire safety and all th those trainings are almost exclusively focused on how to turn a solar battery system off when that home or building is on fire right so meanwhile in puerto rico there's there's a, you know at least firefighters and other emergency responders are aware that hey maybe we need to learn how to turn these things on 
um, if the grid's down for an extended period of time and um, we don't want to, you know, our diesel generator breaks. Um, so I, I think there's, that's not necessarily a not NAPSEP level training. It's more, you know, how to understand the four parts of a solar energy, you know, a solar battery system, right? The modules, the batteries, the charge controller, the inverter, and how those things kind of fit together. And two, how to understand the, or how to think about a solar battery system like a diesel, you know, generator. What's your gas tank? What's your, what are you pulling off of that battery? Um, what are you putting into that battery from the sun? And how much longer do you have to use that system? So if you are gonna run 10 coffee makers in your fire station after a um, major disaster, the you know the energy manager of that station could actually understand maybe we plug out you know maybe we unplug nine of those coffee makers <laughs> because they're not you know the priority loads and we can actually run our whole whole station off off this this system so i guess for us we're really focusing on those kind of uh solar battery training for non-engineer responders so that when we send you know, or dispatch mobile solar stations from a region to a disaster that we don't have to always be on site to triage those loads and to manage um, the system itself. Um, and if we can bridge that gap, I think we can see, a, um, we'd see a sea change in how um, humanitarian response is powered, um, particularly in a decade where most of our humanitarian responses now are climate change associated. Um, COVID is slightly different, but I think that that still there's a, a huge need to connect the sustainability question around energy and humanitarian response with the, the direct impact on the people we're trying to help. So if we are going to decide to run large 200 kilowatt generators in Central Park to power the, the COVID treatment tents, we should at least be aware that that is going to have a detrimental effect on air quality in the surrounding area for patients that are in that are in dealing with severe respiratory distress. That's a great point. Thanks. Uh, well, it's another follow-up question for you. When you use refurbished EV batteries, how much capacity typically remains, and is there any issue with having the batteries out in the trailer due to the heat and the humidity, things like that, that have to be combated? Uh, Awesome. Yeah. Another great question. We source the EV batteries. Um, well, just to back up, a really exciting part about the refurbished EV thing is that most electric vehicle batteries get pulled when they go below 80% of their original capacity. It's, be, it's more of a torque problem. The fact that, you know, if you have four people in, a car, in an electric vehicle, um, it needs that last 20 percent of the charge to do that you know fast discharge to get the the, the vehicle rolling um, and once the, it kind of drains below that 80 percent of original capacity they actually swap them out so a, a lot of these ev batteries are coming off the 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 cars or the trucks or, or the buses or whatever with 80 percent of their their usable capacity left and for Anything that doesn't require moving a large vehicle, <laughs> um, that 80% is still totally viable for everything from medical device charging to um, to cell phones and and uh, air conditioning. You know anything that's a, a lower level load, but over a longer period of time. Um, so so I we see this as a as a huge opportunity to one fulfill continue to fulfill a mission of reducing impact within negative environmental impact within the transition to you know cleaner energies uh, and i say cleaner because nothing is clean you know fully clean um and then uh and also to put these to upcycle you know a technologies and participate in a revolution in mobility that is going to be just as as important as a revolution in, in humanitarian aid. Um, so for the monitoring, um, that's uh, I wish I was in, had a little more engineering um, expertise on this. We work with really good integrators, and they tell us what little sensors to put next to those EV batteries that will shut them down if they get too hot or or too humid. All of the mobile systems, we always put the batteries double encased 
So it's in a battery box, um, usually a, a steel battery case, you know, a large battery shelf inside the, the interior section of, of a trailer. Um, so humidity usually isn't too much of an issue, but I'm sure there are people on this call that know where, way more about this than I do. Um, so I'd, say, I'd defer to them on the actual engineering. Um, we just know that there's going to be a lot of EVs coming off the shelf. And if we don't put them, we reuse them, they're going to be thrown into landfills. And that's silly. Great. Well, I think that we've made it right up to the two o'clock mark. I'd like to thank everyone for joining this webinar today and especially thank our panelists. I think this was a really great overview and we, we got to talk about a lot. I'm sorry if we didn't get to get to your question, but you can always feel free to reach out to Clean Energy Group. Great. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.